So here's another 2018 free response question. Uh, this is problem number three. It appeared on both the AB as well as the BC exams. It's a non-calculator question, and this is pretty typical of, of what's been popping up in problem number three recently. We've got this graph provided to us, and there's some geometry that we're going to have to do within the graph at some point. Uh, and then what they tell us, they label the graph as a graph of G, but then what they tell us in the problem statement is that that continuous function G is really the derivative of function F. So I kind of labeled down here, well, yeah, this is also a graph of F prime. Uh, the function g is piecewise linear, so we've got a line here, a line here, a line here, a line here, a line here. It's a lot of lines. Uh, and then that holds from negative 5 to 3, but then on the interval from 3 to 6, what takes over is this parabola that we see graphed. And there's the, the function for, that represents that parabola. In part a, it asks us, well, it tells us f of 1 is 3, and it asks us to find f of negative 5. And so this is a little weird when you're doing it without any context to it. You've probably done this in application a bunch. Uh, and whenever you have a beginning value of something, whether it's a beginning position, the amount of water that's in a tank at a certain time, and you know the rate that the object is moving, the velocity of the object, the rate that water is entering the tank, you take that starting amount and you add on how much change happens from the, the time you're starting at, which in this case is 1, until the time when you want to know the position, the amount of water in the tank, uh, and in this case that's negative 5. So a little bit weird to be doing this without any context, a little bit weird to be doing this when we're going to a negative value. If you've done enough free response practice, you've probably seen this sort of thing before though. Um, and the rate of change of f is f prime, and this is a graph of f prime. So we have to do this calculation. Now what I notice about this integral right here is that the limits of integration aren't uh, going from low value at the bottom to high value at the top, and I want my area arguments to be able to be utilized the way that I've always developed them, meaning area that's below the x-axis comes back as a negative value, and area above comes back as a positive. So to make that happen, I did flip the limits of integration, and I, in order to do that, you do have to change the sign out in front of the integral. So I had to do this calculation, and so f of 1 was 3. That's pretty easy. They provided us to that or they provided that for us flat out. Uh, and then we had to figure out what to do for this integral right here. So from negative 5 to 1, what I did is I broke this up into a square spanning from negative 5 to negative 2 on the x-axis, a little triangle ranging from negative 2 to negative 1 on the x-axis. Uh, I didn't really have to worry about the stretch of the x-axis from negative 1 to 0 because I don't have any area there. Right, The area of that line is, is a width of 1 and a height of 0, so 0 area. And then I had another little triangle on the stretch of the x-axis from 0 to 1. So within this set of grouping symbols here, which is definitely going to make or break your answer to this question uh, because we're subtracting the value of the integral off of the 3, what I did is I, I recognized, hey, this square has dimensions 3 by 3. Uh, since it's below the x-axis, I have to make that negative. Uh, this triangle has a base of 1 unit and a height of 3 units. And again, because that's below the x-axis, I had to make that negative. Uh, but then this triangle that sits here is above the x-axis. It has a base of one unit, a height of two units. So I did the area one half base times height, uh, added it on as a positive value since it was above the x-axis. Now you're going to have to pay attention to the grading style that your teacher, your professor is taking. If, if you're practicing for the AP exam, you're going to want to leave your answer looking like this, right? They're going to accept an unsimplified numerical value in a non-calculator question like this. I did take a little bit of time to, to go ahead and simplify it to a single value. So as long as I didn't mess up any of the arithmetic, this is what I ended up with for that. But like I said, for AP purposes, this would receive full credit on the AP exams. Just pay attention to the grading style of your teacher and act accordingly. Sorry for the little glitch there. I had a mistake in Part B. I had to fix it and then come back and, and try to do some narration. So um, in Part B, they asked us to evaluate this definite integral from 1 to 6 of g of x. And this is a graph of g of x. So what you're hopefully going to recognize about this situation, the stretch of the graph of g of x from 1 to 6, part of that is going to be able to utilize area arguments, right? From 1 to 3, we can find the area 
uh, beneath the graph of g of x and above the x-axis by finding the area of this square right here. In the area of that square, it's a 2 by 2 square. It's above the x-axis. So we're just going to be able to do the calculation 2 times 2 for the area that sits there. Uh, but the rest of that stretch of g on the interval from 3 to 6 is defined by this parabola. And so if we're trying to find the entire integral from 1 to 6, we're going to have to take the calculation that we just talked about a few seconds ago, uh, which is 2 times 2 or 4 for the definite integral of g of x on the interval 1 to 3. And then we're going to have to add on the rest of that space by doing a, a definite integral from 3 to 6 of that parabola. And so when you go ahead and do this half of the integral. It's, it's definitely more involved than just doing a quick 2 times 2 like we did for the, the signed area there. You have a couple different options. You could FOIL this out, distribute your 2 in, and then just use a power rule for your antiderivative. The route that I went, I, I did a u substitution. I noticed an inner function right here, so I let u equal that inner function. The relationship between du and dx is that the derivative of, of this uh, x minus 4 with respect to x is 1, and so du is a direct replacement for dx. Now when you're doing a definite integral with u substitution, you're changing the differential from a dx to a du, so you need to also change the limits of integration from x values as they start to u values, and that's pretty easy. You just have to take the x value that's at the top, put it in place of the x that's right here. 6 minus 4 gives us the new upper limit of integration. Same thing with the lower limit of integration, which gives us a lower limit of integration of negative 1. Uh, I then have to find the antiderivative of 2u to the second with respect to u. So if I find that antiderivative, I add 1 to the exponent, I divide by the new exponent. You see I copied that constant 2 into that antiderivative. I didn't need a plus C here because it's a definite integral. So using the fundamental theorem of calculus, I can toss in the upper limit of integration uh, of 2. I can toss in the lower limit of integration of negative 1. I can take a difference, and I've got that half of the integral done. Like I mentioned at the conclusion of Part A, if, if you're practicing for the AP exam or if your teacher is telling you they're going to grade your paper with an AP grading style, this right here would receive full credit. Uh, on the AP exam or with a teacher who's telling you they're taking an AP grading style. Uh, if you were in a college setting, if, if your teacher's saying, hey, yeah, you can do that on the AP exam, but I want you to simplify. Again, as long as I did my arithmetic right, what I ended up with for that definite integral is 10. So in part C, they ask us to deal with the open interval from negative 5 to 6, and then they ask us on which open intervals is f both increasing and concave up and then as always give a reason for your answer so i kind of tried to lay out my reasoning up front here so i i realized that f of x is increasing when f prime of x is positive and f of x is concave up when f double prime of x is positive now what you have to be careful of here is that we're dealing with a graph of g and they're asking this question about f right so we definitely have to make sure we're acting accordingly as we try to develop this conclusion but uh, here's the reasoning when is f prime positive when is f double prime also positive we'll do what we need to do with the graph of g to determine those and develop our conclusion from there so we're already told in the problem statement that g is the derivative of f so f prime is equal to g of x. When is g of x greater than 0? Well, this is a graph of g. g of x is greater than 0 on the interval from 1 to 4. It looks like it's back to 0 at 4, but then on the other side of 4, we're back to positive values. So we have a positive value for g of x, and hence a positive value for f prime of x on these intervals. When is f double prime of x positive? A little bit trickier here because we do have to take the derivative of the left side of this equation to generate f double prime. But when we take the derivative of the right side of this equation, we get a g prime. So the second derivative of f is equal to the first derivative of g, and we want to know when that's positive. So to figure out when g prime is positive, what we have to look at on this graph is we have to look at slopes of the tangent line since the slope of a tangent line is always going to be indicated uh, is always going to indicate the value of the derivative of a graph. So when is the slope of g positive? Well on the stretch of the graph from negative 2 to negative 1 it's positive. On the stretch of the graph from 0 to 1 it's positive. And then again on the stretch from 4 onward to 6 it's positive. And so here are the intervals where f double prime is positive, and hence f of x is concave up. Where do those two things happen simultaneously? So the intersections of these two answers is 0, 1, uh, and then also from 4 the rest of the way to 6. The last part of this is really sort of tricky. So um, 
I saw we wanted to find points of inflection on the graph of f. And again, we have to make sure we recognize it's not the graph that we're presented with, it's the graph of the function f. This is a derivative of f. Uh, give a reason for your answer. Once again, I tried to provide the reasoning up front. So I said inflection points happen when you have a change in concavity at a point on the graph of a function. Uh, concavity is determined by the second derivative. So I kind of reestablished that relationship between the second derivative of f and the first derivative of g, just like we used in part c. And I needed to know when that changes signs at an x value. I have in parentheses here, not after being zero for an interval, and we'll kind of talk about why I've mentioned that in, in just a minute or so. Um, but anytime you have a sign change in g prime, there's a sign change in f double prime, and we are going to have an inflection point there as long as it happens at a point, not at a not across an interval. And this actually only happens at four. The reason why it happens at four, think about the sign of g prime to the left of four. Right here we have negatively sloped tangent lines on the graph of g. On the other side of four, we have positively sloped tangent lines, and at four we have a horizontal tangent line. So g prime is zero at four. It's negative to the left of 4, and it's positive to the right of 4. Uh, that means f prime is going through those same changes in signs, negative to 0 to positive. We do have a change in concavity at 4. That is where we have an inflection point on this graph. What's really weird about this problem is that that's not necessarily the only sign change for f double prime or the only sign change for g prime. So I tried to sketch a little graph here to, to kind of convince you why we're not going to have another inflection point. So I tried to sketch a graph of f and I tried to sketch it on the interval from zero to just a little bit beyond four. And so what I noticed about the graph of the derivative of f, which is again the graph that we're looking at here, the derivative is positive on that entire stretch, right? Positive, 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 positive. And so when I say the derivative is positive, I'm looking at this as a graph of the derivative. I guess it is zero at four, uh, but I'm, I'm basically drawing something that's always increasing from zero the rest of the way to, to what I've through what I've sketched across the x-axis here. Uh, I saw that g prime was positive here, and so f prime had to be positive. So I need to be increasing and concave up from zero to one. But then what's really weird is what happens on the stretch of the graph from one to three. On the stretch of the graph from one to three, f prime has a constant value of 2, right? This is a graph of f prime. f prime has a constant value of 2 on the stretch of the graph from 1 to 3. So I, I'm concave up here, and I actually have no concavity on the stretch of the graph from 1 to 3, because the only way I can have a constant slope of 2 is if I draw a line segment with a, a slope of 2 from 1 the rest of the way to, to 3, where that constant slope is, is finally going to change when we come out on the other side of 3. And so what happens on the other side of 3 is the, so I'm looking at this as a graph of f prime again. My slope has to still be positive, but it's beginning to tr tr trend towards 0 until it finally is 0 at 4, and then it's going to come out on the other side as positive again. So I'm, I'm still looking at a positive slope, positive slope, positive slope. I have 0 slope right here at 4, and on the other side, I have to have my slope increase again. So in order for my slope to go back to increasing, I'm going to have to transition from being concave down to concave up. So although there's a change in concavity from concave up, here to concave down here, that happens after a stretch of the graph where there was no concavity. So the concavity doesn't change at a point, it happens uh, after an interval that's sort of weird. So kind of a unique problem, haven't really seen much of this in free response questions before. Hopefully this discussion has been helpful to you.